Chapter 9, Whirly Gig, Everybody Swing. Though his last name was Bishop, Brent felt like a rook riding north on I-95, making another end-to-end chess move along the country's perimeter. He traversed the alligator, plantation tour, and Robert E. Lee belts, and then tried to sleep through Washington, Baltimore, Wilmington, Philadelphia, and Newark. The steaming streets and long skeins of graffiti magnifying his yearning for Maine. He transferred in New York at the Port Authority, the one place his father had urged him to avoid, and managed to hold on to his wallet and his life. The bus rolled past the exit from Milford, Connecticut, where he'd lived for two years. He looked out but didn't recognize anything, and then he forgot to get off in New Haven and call his grandmother as he had promised he would. He changed buses again in Boston, where he had an aunt and uncle and cousins, none of whom he desired to see. They were his past. The bus crossed a bridge, high and arched like a silver rainbow. A sign welcomed him to Maine. Brent stared out. This was his present. He stepped off into it in Portland. It was 5 p.m. He strolled Congress Street and found his way to the bed and breakfast and the first he'd ever stayed in. He was primed to like it, but found it too similar to a small dinner party with strangers. His overly sociable hostess interviewing him about his trip with great interest in trying to get him to converse with the other guests at breakfast. The simplest questions forced him into lies. He preferred the less demanding social life of the bus and restaurants and motels. He'd have rather been out in the country as well, walking to the, waking to the ocean instead of the garbage truck below his window. He decided to move on, got a ride with one of the guests who was heading north, glimpsed a billboard for a campground on Costco Bay, and climbed onto the village of Weeksboro, climbed out in the village of Weeksboro. A series of signs led him toward the camp, taking him past a small grocery where he stopped to replenish his food supply. He came to the town hall and then the village green and stopped before a poplar tree, its leaves shaking and shimmering in the breeze, the ancestors of all whirly gigs. Nearby stood a statue of a Civil War soldier. Brent approached as if he'd been summoned and found himself reading through the list of Weeksboro's fallen Union soldiers. The past was palpable here, a feeling that deepened when he detoured through the cemetery and found a slate headstone dated 1798. People, he noticed, had died young in the past. He thought of Leah. Many graves belonged to children. Pushing on, he passed between two white churches glaring at each other across the street and then turned left onto Bolton Road and half a mile down reached Howlett's campground. It was privately owned, a fact made obvious by the continuing parade of hand-painted signs. Welcome! Glad you found us! Cliff and Vera. Free firewood, showers, and ping pong. Also free fog, rain, and mosquitoes. Park at any unoccupied site, then check in at the office. Office hours from whenever we feel like it till whenever we don't. He looked at the Parisian blue sky while he walked half surprised it wasn't labeled with a sign. Striking out down a path to the water, he surveyed a sandy cove and then returned and passed through a grassy camping area with many free spots but no privacy. He continued on and found a site more to his liking among the trees with a table and a barbecue and seclusion. He could see none of the other campers. There would be no need to hide his work, a physical and psychological luxury. He pried off his pack, dug out his tent, and strung his rope between a tree and the table leg. The tube of orange plastic hung on this, becoming triangular when he climbed inside and unrolled his sleeping bag. He lay down, listening to the wind and the waves. Strange, he thought, that he had kept to the coast. Leah's mother had required this. Was it because he'd come from Chicago near the center of the country? He'd certainly fled as far as he could, turning his gaze away out to sea. Each of his four vantages had been different. He inhaled the air, delightfully cool and sharp-tipped with a green evergreen scent. I'm in Maine, he said aloud, and then confirmed this astounding fact by naming in order every city he could remember on the four bus trips that had brought him there, his geographical genesis. He walked to the office to check in. It was empty. The date, Tide Times weather report had been written on a chalkboard. Past issues of the Portland Press Herald lay on the table next to the sign reading, Please place most recent on top. Brent began to wonder if the Howlett's small universe was entirely self-service. He opened a paper to the weather page, studied the national map, and then checked the details for Seattle, San Diego, and Tampa. He pictured his whirligigs in their respective weathers. He almost felt he could look out through them and see people passing and birds overhead. 
He moved on to other distant scenes, postcards sent by previous campers. They were tacked to a corkboard, overlapping like shingles, many with their messages facing out. He read them all. Sampling other lives, hoping for a hint of where to point his own. Nearby was a shelf marked book exchange, another camera obscura offering views of the campers' lives, getting organized, all for love, the best of Charlie Brown, code name Attila. He was leafing through the ladder when a white bearded man in overall strode in. Put one in, you take one out. Anything else I can do for you? Brent savored his strong main accent. I just came to check in. I'm in number 18. Ooh, back among the spruces. Brent had, thought, Brent had thought they were pines. He made a note of this. That's a real good sight for building your wrist muscles. Brent was baffled. From slapping mosquitoes, the man opened his registration book. That table there in 18 is new. The old one had more names on it than the Constitution. Went to the dump, found half a dozen perfectly good two-by-eights, just needed a few rusty nails pulled out. The Lord doth provide, and the dump's where he does it. Most folks don't realize that. Brent signed in. The man glanced around. I built half of my house and all of this office from what I picked up there, right down to the doorknobs. Brent looked, but could find no sign of the room's Frankensteinish-like origin. Helps keep the prices down. Ten dollars a day. How long would you be staying with us? Three, four days? All summer, you mean? Brent stared. The man gave no sign of jesting. No, just a couple of days. In Maine, lad, a couple of days in July is the summer, beginning to end. Brent ambled back to his camp, noticed the table's fresh coat of red paint, and vowed to be careful with his drill and saw. He felt anxious to start. He made a sandwich, decided to pick his next project while he ate, and then could not find the whirling gig book. Three times he checked all of his pack's compartments. He'd been reading it among coming into Portland. He realized he must have left it on the bus. He pictured it traveling on without him, crossing into Canada perhaps, inspiring someone to build a string of whirling gigs that Brent would never know of. He ate. Without the book, he felt abandoned. Searching for it, he found he was very low on hardware as well as wood. A blue jay perched nearby, ruckusly panhandling him. He threw it some bread, thinking of fairy tales in which generous deeds are rewarded tenfold. No mountain of building supplies appeared, but in his mind there materialized the notion of a whirling gig all its own. Its plan found in no book in the world, its ingredients, his remaining scraps, and whatever he could scavenge as the campground owner had. Surely there would be wood on the beach. He emptied his pack so as to use it as a carrier, and he marched toward the water. The tide was out, its wear spread on wet sand. He picked up shells, finishing line, a length of rope, but little usable wood. The air was brisk. Two kayakers passed. He followed them enviously with his eyes and scouted the islands on the horizon. Coming to the end of the cove, he clambered up into the great slabs of granite and crossed them until he reached another beach. Here he gleefully picked through a long bargain bin of driftwood. He salvaged what he could from an old lobster trap and then discovered a pair of sand dollars and was so intent on looking down that he didn't notice the woman seated against a rock until he almost tripped over her. <gasps> Sorry, he said, and then he saw she had a watercolor set and was painting a crab shell beside her. That's great, he added. Thanks. She brushed aside a long strand of gray hair and smiled up at him. I'm not so sure it has the proper ness. What do you think? What's ness, he asked. She cleaned her brush. Well, in the case of a crab shell, it should be roughness to the touch and lightness and hollowness. Brent bent down and judged. Definitely. You think so? I'm glad, she glanced at him. Do you paint? Not really. Just a little bit. Well, sort of. He thought of... His recent efforts, oversized eyes, drip, drips running down the wood, and watched in wonder as she somehow ferried the crab's qualities to paper. A sort of artist? <laughs> That's me too. He was, she was small and tanned and dressed in jeans and a moth nod blue sweater. Brent thought her thick gray hair beautiful and wondered why his mother dyed hers. When I was your age, I honestly dreamed of painting a world-famous masterpieces. She mixed a pale orange. Now... I just paint. She did so in silence and then turned toward Brent. This morning they played me some Corelli on the radio, composed in 1681. Don't you find it amazing that we're still listening to it whole centuries later? Brent wondered how long his whirly gig would last. I guess so. 
Amazing and rare. The darkness swallows up so much of us. She swirled her brush into a jar of water. Not that he would know we still play it. She gestured toward a house, tall and white as a lighthouse out on a point. I very nearly walked outside and called, Hello, Archangelo Corelli, as loud as I could across the water. Is that crazy? Have you ever wanted to do that? He liked the way she spoke to him as to an adult. I wouldn't call it crazy. He noticed that tied to her belt loops were short strips of bright fabric. What are those for? Just for color, she said. Why not? It's so dreary so much of the year here, she looked up. What sort of art do you do? I make whirly gigs. The words had come out without his permission. He wanted them back and then decided that they were safe with her. Really, how unusual and how wonderful. She studied him, grinning her green eyes bright. Perhaps you'll become their Archangelo Corelli. He smiled in return and sat on the sand. They talked for an hour, watching the gulls drop shells on the rocks and crack them, and then went their separate ways. And by the time Brent returned, his pack was as full as Santa Claus's sack. He laid his finds on the table and circled it. Ideas for whirling gigs streamed through his mind like clouds in constant metamorphosis. He scrutinized, weighed, and considered his ingredients while the sun dipped behind the trees. The mosquitoes emerged. He kept them at bay with a fire and then boiled water in his pot and dumped in about half a bag of noodles. He poured off the water once they were done, sliced slivers of cheese on top with his knife, and felt himself a true French chef. And when the sky overhead became black... He left the woods in search of the stars. The main camping area flickered with fires. Two children were playing badminton by lantern light. Brent walked to the cove. He turned his head up and he smiled as if stepping into a party. The faces there were familiar. He'd missed them. The past several nights had been cloudy. He noticed at once how much lighter the big and little dippers were. Riding north from Florida, he'd covered 20 degrees of latitude. Part of the tail of Scorpius was now hidden below the southern horizon. He wondered what new stars he'd gained to the north. He slipped the red cellophane over his flashlight, opened his book, The Circumpo Circumpolar Stars, and availed himself to his new view. At dawn, a barking dog woke him. He gazed toward the east out of this tent's open end, and the ten different reds quickly came and went, as if the sky were showing color samples. He studied the cloud's calligraphy, their foreign alphabet indecipherable, and then a dam of light burst and flooded the east. The sun rose. The dawn display ended. It had all gone so quickly, like a dazzling amusement park flying past the bus window. The darkness swallows up most of us. He heard the words spoken in the painter's voice and suddenly saw his whirly gig hole. He started in it then and there and labored for three and a half days on it. He played his harmonica when he felt like a break and one day walked to the fabled town dump, returning with a small junk shop in his pack. The weather it held clear. Each morning he woke to the purring of the lobster boats and each night went to sleep with two years before the mast and his flashlight. After lunch, he stopped in at an office and consulted the shelf of nature guides, searching for shells he'd found or birds he'd seen and writing their names in notebooks. In this way, he knew it was a black-capped chickadee that seemed to be chattering its congratulations at the very moment he finished his whirly gig. He contemplated his work over lunch. It was three times the size of the others that he had built. The pinwheels on the front, snipped and fashioned from soda cans, stood be claimed. Likewise, the dozen propellers made from golf motive coasters, linoleum scraps, license plates, and lobster trap slats. On the blades of one four-bladed model, he painted Leah's four-part name. He considered the plywood rendition of her face. It was the most faithful of the four he'd made, and for the first time, he'd given her a slight smile, painstakingly copied from her photograph. The head was large, giving him room to glue sea glass and red reflectors in her hair. Her skin glistened because it was mane. He'd given the wood an extra coat of varnish. He had drilled holes in the shells and made her a necklace hanging it over her head, along with a set of wind chimes he'd rescued from the dump. Maine summers like dawn colors were brief. Darkness and winter predominated. Leah's life had been similarly short, but his clacking, flashing, jingling memorial would give off sound and color all year, holding back the tide of death. It was a kinetic gravestone painted in ever-blooming greens and yellows and reds. Leah would not be swallowed up. He walked to the cove. He wanted it mounted there and liked the idea that the first winds to come ashore from the Pacific Gulf and Atlantic would turn his whirly gig. He spent an hour hunting for a site that was far enough 
Above high tide as well as safe from campers, there weren't any suitable trees available. He wondered if the campground owner would let him sink a pole in the ground, and then he looked across the water to the south and had a better idea. The painter's house, perched above the water on a treeless point, with no high tides or falling limbs or campers to worry about. The whirly gig was heavy, awkward to carry, and conspicuous in the extreme. He ignored the stairs he drew in the campground, decided it would be easier to take the road, and was the cause of much breaking and head swiveling. The day was hot, his arm muscles burned. He shifted the contraption onto his head just as a breeze flowed over him, setting it ringing and spinning. It was engaged with the wind as if by a gear. Making his way up a hill, he listened to his respiration and his own wind surging in and out and felt at one with the whirly gig. The breeze picked up as he neared the woman's house, increasing the clatter and motion overhead. He spotted her weeding and supposed he must look like a demented relative of the Wright brothers. Nervously, he awaited her head's turning. Oh, my, was all she could say at first. She got to her feet, jeans damp at the knees. Her agile eyes took in his strange cargo. Brent feasted on her smile of delight. It's wonderful, truly, she stroked the chimes. It makes me feel like a child, and what painter in the Louvre wouldn't envy that power? Brent rested it on a metal chair and watched her roam it with his eyes. A gust set it and strips of bright fabric on her belt loop fluttering. He realized that they hadn't exchanged names. He liked the way she put important things first and left trivialities for last. He was glad he'd come. It reminds me of those Tibetan flags that flap in the wind sending out prayers. She flickered a propeller and admired the sea glass. It's a one-man band for the eyes. Bravo! Thanks, Brent cleared his throat. Actually, I was wondering if I could put it up here, if you wouldn't mind. You don't want to keep it? I can't, and I made it to be here in Maine, by the coast. He stopped before he could say more than he wanted to. Oh, I'd be thrilled and honored, her eyes sparkled. Where do you think it ought to go? They strolled her grounds and toured her garden, discussing sights and dozens of other topics. An hour later, Brent had removed a decrepit birdhouse from a metal pole and mounted the whirly gig in its place. I promise you no birds use that house, said the woman, and when it goes to the dump, it might be just what some sculptor needs. They were drinking lemonade on the porch, both of them facing the whirly gig and the long view up the coast. Chickadees droned in the sultry air. Now tell me, or don't, you have a perfect right not to. Is the woman someone real? I noticed her name. Brent sipped. She was. He sipped again and then held the icy glass to his cheek, partially hiding his face. She died in a car accident in Chicago in May. The painter put her hand to her sternum. Oh, no. He was relieved they weren't facing each other. It was my fault. I'm the one who killed her. He listened to himself as if to a stranger. I'd been drinking, actually, at a party. The woman inhaled. I'm so sorry. You must... I was actually trying to kill myself, and I killed her instead by accident. It was like falling down the basement stairs, unexpected and unstoppable. Brent felt dizzy, unsure of where he was. He knew he hadn't let out this last fact before, not to his parents, the police, or the psychologist. He felt empty inside like a chicken from the store with its plastic bag of organs removed. He was glad the woman didn't know his name. He wanted to leave his confession like his whirly gigs anonymously. It's hard to know what to say, the painter murmured. She set down the drink. They both stared out to see. From our chats, you certainly don't strike me as a killer or suicidal. Just look at your artwork. The wind toyed with the chimes, turned the row of pinwheels into blurs. Only someone with a strong life force could possibly have created that. The cicadas pulsed, and then they were silent. I'm sure you know that we all get depressed, seriously, sometimes. Most of us probably think about throwing in the towel at some point. She paused, and God knows we all make mistakes. All of the above in my case, she looked at Brent. I could be wildly wrong, but my sense of you is that you're a good person, not a bad one. The words worked their way through Brent's brain, and then the fact that he might in fact be like someone else with a foreign idea never considered, that he could have done what he'd done and still be good was an even more startling notion. He remembered the note from the motel maid, no one is alone with Jesus. Jesus forgave you no matter what you'd done, but that was his business and the priests and the ministers. They were professional forgivers. They said it's okay the same way your parents say they love you, whether they 
mean it or not. This, though, was different. Hearing himself forgiven freely by someone he trusted, he wasn't sure, though, that she knew enough to forgive him, so he told her the story in detail, and it did not seem to change her mind. The sun lowered toward the hills. Brent declined the woman's offer for dinner. He felt all talked out. Producing the camera, he took four pictures of the whirligig from various angles and distances, the last one with the painter beside it. They exchanged farewells. Brent continued into town. He bought groceries then and scented food coming from the diner nearby and decided he couldn't wait to eat until he made it back to camp. He stepped in, took a seat in the front corner, watching the comings and goings out the window as if he were in a trance. He couldn't quite believe the world was his to enter. He felt dazed and stayed on as his table long after his meal had been cleared. Across the street, cars were parking and people were walking into the town hall. He paid, drifted out, heard music, and followed the others as if he were under hypnosis. A pianist was pounding out chords on a stage, surrounded by a fiddler, a flutist, a woman plucking a stand-up bass. Beside them, a gangling man was calling out steps to the two rows of dancers below. The music was brisk, bouncy, and infectious. Brent watched inconspicuously, leaning against a wall. Except for a few teenagers, the hall resembled a reunion of some 60s commune with plenty of beards and ponytails in view. The caller's promptings, like an auctioner's spiel, seemed almost to be in a foreign language. All in left now, ladies, chain, left hand star, back to your right, activities, down and back, cast off, everybody swing! Couples turned in circles. Skirts were rippling. Brent stared. It was a human whirly gig, set in motion by music instead of wind. He sank into a chair and watched the dance after dance. And suddenly, a young woman rushed up to him. Hey, we need one more couple, she held out her hands. To his great amazement, he agreed. A few people clapped when he got to his feet. As before, the caller walked them through the dance slowly without any music. Brent now recognized some of the steps, knowing hands turned him left instead of right and pointed him toward the proper partner and then the music started up at full speed and the dancers like clock parts began to turn arms reached for his faces whizzed by he was instantly enmeshed with the others wordlessly they corrected him adjusted his grip smiled at him he'd always been gawky this hadn't changed but the pattern of steps repeated over and only slowly began to sink in the galloping toot had an irish feel it was exulting to be part of the twining and twirling and strangely thrilling to touch others hands and feel them grasping his he felt like a bee returning to a hive greeted and accepted by all he clapped with the others when the music stopped, stood outside to cool off, and was promptly asked if he wanted to do the next one. His partner called the event a contra dance. It felt to Brent like his right of reentry. He stayed all the way to the waltz at the end. He slept late, and when he awoke, he could still hear the music and see the wide smile of the woman who driven him back. Birds were busy in the trees around him. He looked outside. The day was clear. He lay there for half an hour and then realized that he'd finished Leah's mother's task. He built a fire, cooked himself some oatmeal, peering into the flames. The guilt had not magically vanished overnight. Four whirly gigs wouldn't accomplish that. He knew it would reside in him like ashes after a fire unconsumed. But something had changed. He felt oddly buoyant. His, he discovered as well that a new view lay before his mind's eye. He saw himself returning to Chicago and to his parents, delivering the photographs, starting at a new school in the fall. These had been beyond the horizon until now. He began readying himself to meet them. He felt that he was up to it. He put out his fire and packed his tent and then took out Leah's photo. It struck him now that the crash wasn't only something that he had done to her. When they'd met, he was longing to be swallowed up by blackness. She'd set him in motion, motion that he was now transferring to others. He replaced the photo and took out his bus pass. It did not expire until August 17th. He had another three weeks left on it. He wouldn't mind seeing New Hampshire and Vermont, and then maybe camping on Lake George in New York. Someone he'd met at the dance had just come back from a canoeing trip there. He thought he might build some more whirly gigs. Maybe he'd start on a lifetime project of putting one up in every state. He put on his pack and walked down to the office. He paid, and then he backtracked toward the cove, squinted, and made out his whirly gig bright against the painter's white house. The breeze off the water ruffled his hair and made the whirly gig flash in a distance. 
He interlocked some of the propeller blades so that one would pass its motion to the other. In his mind, his whirligigs were meshed the same way parts of single coast-to-coast -coast creations were. The world itself was a whirligig, its myriad parts invisibly linked, the hidden crankshafts and connecting rods carrying motion across the globe and over centuries. He took off his pack. A few nights before, he'd come to the end of two years before the mast, the author's ship finally returning safely to Boston Harbor. He pulled out the book, felt linked with the writer Andy Meal and the others he'd met on the trip, and he walked back inside the office. He placed it on the book exchange shelf, aware he was nudging an invisible gear forward. He wondered who would read it next. He scanned the titles and decided on the strange lies of familiar insects. Outside, a warm breeze ran its fingers through his toes. He started reading while he walked down the road. The end.